so I'm super excited to welcome Andreas Wilhelm in our third Meet and Nose session. Uh, a little context about this program. It's basically, we, we use the term nose with some irony uh, because you know everyone has a nose and everyone for the most part uses it, but some of us use it more than others. Uh, so we're inviting sort of in, interesting people. I don't really know how else to describe it, but interesting people in the field of perfumery to, to talk with us in these sessions, one hour each, uh, just to get a sense of everyone's practice and sort of the diversity of practices on, on a global scale. Uh, I've known Andreas for quite a while. Um, he's, I, I guess I would call him a friend. And I've always really been struck by his idiosyncratic and unconventional, maybe a little anarchistic approach to how he does his work. So uh, I was very thrilled to invite him to do this. And I think you guys will find that he's a pretty interesting cat. So Andreas, welcome. Thanks for having me. Hello. Hello to everybody. Happy to see all, all of you. And Andreas is in Zurich, so, so he's calling in from Switzerland. Um, just a little context. So Andreas, I think we'll just get right into it. Um, I'm curious about sort of um, your trajectory as a perfumery. How did you come to perfumery? What was the thing that brought you there uh, initially? Yeah, actually, I wanted to become a silversmith when I was uh, 15. And then my job advisor, he told me that uh, that's an illusion because there are only two silversmiths um, vacancies to, to learn the job uh, in the area. But then he proposed me to apply as a lab technician um, at the lab technician school in Chivoda. And Chivoda uh, is quite close, so with the bicycle, five, ten minutes. And it actually it was a lucky decision. So I, I had a three-year training there. Uh, to become a lab technician and I could already work in different fields. I mean, first in the R&D research and development in organic chemistry, then also a little bit in biotechnology. And uh, yeah, and there I got really the virus um, about perfumery. Were you coming across a lot about of perfume? Odors. Were you coming across a lot of perfume? Well, yeah, because Jibudan is a, a fragrance house, of course. So you were yeah, exactly. It was a fragrance house. So um, even today, I can use some ingredients, uh, Ultrasur or uh, Floridral, where I was working on the synthesis. For some of the ingredients, I was even the first human, let's say like this, um, the first human on Earth could, could smell them. Um, wow. Because I, I was doing first time the synthesis for uh, Ultrasur, for example. And uh, yeah, it was funny because later in the perfumery when i started really to be to be, be trained as a perfumer this was in 1999 um, then i realized that some of the ingredients i had to learn that they really took me back in the time and when i looked up the compendium and the information i could see how oh, it was a uh, yano shinde my chemist who wrote the, the formula the structure first time or the way of synthesis and then even i could find that uh, my team leader was mentioned it as the uh, uh, first guy on earth uh, compounding or creating this molecule. So I, I, I was not wrong then feeling, oh, I know this molecule from a couple of uh, years ago. That's a, so, I, I mean, uh, okay, this is awesome. How, how does a person synthesize a molecule? Like, how does that process work? I don't, I don't think anybody really oh, gets it outside of chemistry. It's actually like playing Lego with part of molecules. And then, of course, you have a one part Lego, which is an acid, organic acid, for example, to keep it simple. And then you let this organic acid Lego part um, combine to, for example, an alcohol. Then, of course, in between, we speak about uh, esterification. So the water goes away and you get a new molecule. And for example, if you, if you take a butyric acid, which is very, very animal or very uh, acidic smells of vomit, and you, let me, I just don't want to say something wrong. Um, and then you um, cook it, you boil it with uh, ethanol, with al ethyl alcohol. Yeah. Um, then it separates water and out of it, you get ethyl butyrate, which smells of uh, overripe kiwis, for example. So this is how you can uh, 
yeah, imagine. And of course, some other scientists way they had like five or six steps, and in, in between you had to do purification, rectification, means distillation, sometimes uh, recrystallization, and, and so on. And it was like really like playing around and uh, with Legos. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I fully get it still, but <laughs> I appreciate the Lego analogy because I can imagine that. Um, did you did you really did you take to chemistry? Did you enjoy it? I mean, was this something that was? No, actually, I had uh, two really bad years because at that time I was not so willing to learn, and chemistry was quite a book with uh, seven seals. But I had a very good chemist, and he. Sorry to say, he squeezed my balls every day. So every day he gave me kind of uh, um, a challenge. And I mean, and then he, he let me really think about it until I found uh, the result out of it. So, and uh, like this, and there was no internet, you know, we could only read in books. There was a huge library at Shibodo. And uh, yeah, by time I, I somehow I got it into my wings. I mean, I'm not really high, I'm not knowing everything about chemistry, but somehow I, I got the feeling for it. So it's maybe only this, even today in perfumery, if it comes down to, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, technical perfumery, if you speak about uh, softeners or, uh, or soap or whatever, then I already see molecules, they won't be stable in these medias because I know a little bit of chemistry. Wow. So, the, so the chemistry really helps inform your your practice from a technical perspective, obviously. But what about creative? I mean, does the chemistry? I don't know. I mean, does it have any sort of creative um, impact on your work, or is it just really something that? Oh, somebody's calling us. How bizarre! Or is it just technical for you? Yeah, I mean, funny wise, the the creativity starts where the the technique is the technical part is much more challenging. I mean, for example, in, a, in an acidic media, you are not allowed to use esters because, or not all of them, at a certain point they will break up. But if you're still looking for a fruity note, then you, you really have to create, um, maybe using two, three other ingredients, they are stable, giving you the same um, olfactive direction. So I, I would say, yeah, chemistry or issues, technical issues coming from the chemical side, they push you to be more creative. That's interesting. If I may say so. Yeah, a lot of people say those sorts of technical issues or restraints actually enforce creativity. People are saying that a lot about IFRA, for instance. Um, so, so, but getting back to sort of your creative process, so, so at what point did you move from chemistry into perfumery? Perfumery is a creative uh, medium. Yeah. Actually, after my training to become a uh, lab technician, I started to do my own, let's say, uh, creams and body lotions. Uh, I was really infected, so I started using quite basic, uh, let's say, I, I, I washed my laundry with uh, using a bit of patchouli, and then I was so proud to, I could change my smell, oh my God. And this really took me in completely, I mean, Nowadays, I, I, I have funny feelings when I look back because it was so, so basic, but the essential oils was everything you could get free available uh, in, in certain shops at that time. I mean, nowadays, each and everyone knowing a little bit the industry or knowing some, how to say, know how to do an internet research, you, today you can find uh, almost all the ingredients to, to be delivered to your home. So, I mean, to, today people, beginners or um, yeah, people from outside of the industry, they have much more uh, access actually to the ingredients. So much, yeah, much a bigger sure. playground than I had at that time. But I mean, I find that interesting because you worked at Givaudan. So, I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't work with the Givaudan materials when you were playing around or did you have to use? No, stuff? at that time, my training or my, my school was over. So oh, they I kept see. me until I had to um, join the army for uh, three or four, four or five months. They kept me and I could see all the production area. So I'm, I, for example, one week I had to extract uh, via Soxlet, it means uh, an organic solvent, which is uh, evaporating, condensing, running through kind of a tea bag of vanilla, vanilla beans. 
So, <laughs> and then to, to extract uh, the aroma, the aromatic profile. So for example, one week I did uh, 700 kg of vanilla beans. The next, uh, next week I had to do uh, four tons of fig um, and so on and so on. And we ah. made cheese, eight, eight tons uh, every week. And the cheese afterwards, you just flavored with a 100 ml bottle each ton. And then this, this was the decision, will we do Gorgonzola or uh, um, Emmental or, or Appenzeller or any other cheese. So oh. for, for me, it was interesting because I had quite a complete overview already. And at that time, I was like 19 or 20. And I had already a view in a lot of different fields of perfumery. But again, I had no job anymore. So I was uh, working as a regular um, lab technician doing a kind of uh, for the flavor industry it was another company and at that time we we, we had to do the analysis of the raw materials means for fennel seeds uh, ginseng uh, ginger we were extracting these uh, these raw materials to do the essential oils and partly i could take some of the essential oils i made myself in the lab out of 100 gram of any seed with this essential oil i could work or wow. I could go and buy some. So this at, at that stage, this was my my playground. So it was a really independent practice to your to your real work uh, at that at that stage. So at what stage did you sort of start to get at serious stage, about yeah. being a perfumer? I mean, what was the transition from independent to? The transmission was a job announcement from Lucy, ah. a small uh, company <laughs> <laughs> in my neighborhood, actually, also around Switzerland, around Zurich. And they were looking for a trainee perfumer to become a junior perfumer. Uh, so I, I applied and because with my background coming from Shibodal, knowing a bit of chemistry, um, I, got, I was the lucky one getting this uh, three years uh, training to become a perfumer. And this was back in 1999. And then, of course, I started as being a normal industrial perfumer, industrial driven or industrial teached perfumer. So, I mean, I, I got the set with, uh, I think, first first two, two three months, there was like 120 natural raw materials, essential oils, some extract, absolutes, um, which I had to memorize. And we had some tests, uh, of course. Um, on the other hand, the other part of my time, because it was a hundred percent job, I was helping out in the factory, in the production, doing big batches of perfume, just to, to to start to get a feeling more and more. Because, for example, if you do something in the lab, ten grams, um, you you face other problems if you do it in in uh, five hundred kg. I mean, for example, speaking about solubility, how to dissolve a, a big amount of uh, tonalide in a in a in a big vessel this is needs a lot of energy or a lot of mixing energy and uh, yeah while in the lab you you don't see that actually or you don't realize because you heat up a little bit more you mix a little bit more and then uh, it's dissolved so this gave me also a little bit of uh, extra training then i think after yeah, two, two, three months, I started to learn all the synthetic, or not all the synthetic, it was a, a set of like 300 synthetic raw materials. I had to classify them, uh, um, learn a bit, study a bit about, uh, how to say, doing applications means uh, in which media they are stable. Do they bring um, enough um, effect? Do they, have, do they have enough performance for the, because, for the money, it's in the industry is always driven about money. If I use a raw material and it doesn't bring any value to the formula, it, I will lose the business because my competitor, they're not using uh, unnecessary ingredients in the formula because it will drive the cost up. So mm. the moment you 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 use, uh, I don't know, um, I don't find, find an example now, but... Um, yeah. If you if you use a benzyl alcohol, it doesn't have a, a lot of smell, and especially if you have a little bit of benzaldehyde around or something, uh, or other balsamic notes, then to load one ingredient into your formula doesn't have a big impact, makes the manufacturing by one position more expensive, right. uh, you know. So there's a lot of pressure to reduce to the bare essentials, huh? 
Yeah. So was there one material when I was a kid and I was doing my multiplication tables, six by seven, six times seven was something I could just never remember. I had like a blank spot. Was there a material like that for you in, in, in your training that just didn't, could just didn't get in there for yeah. some reason? Yeah. 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 It, it's, it's not about getting in there. It was more about, about uh, being perceivable. So I okay. can't smell polycyclic masks okay. alone on the blotter. Mm -hmm. And my boss, he always kicked my ass. But funny wise, I see the, in a combination, I see the effect, for example, galaxolite is bringing. So if you show me a complex formula and you ask me if there is galaxolite in it, I can prove it. I can tell you, yes, there is because I smell it. But mm -hmm. if you show me just one blotter only galaxolite, it could be water as well. So wow, I've heard I've heard of this that. This was That's a bit cool. challenging. Yeah, I bet. So uh, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't even know how to ask you how that how to describe the effect that you sense from galax. How do, how would you describe the effect that you sense from galaxolite? I mean, how do you know it's there if you can't smell? Is it? it huh. <laughs> this is where language it, fails. It pushes a certain smell, but it I I can't say it's it's kind of a, don't. If, if it's not true if I say warm plastic, but it's a feeling, yeah. It's a feeling. Somehow it it's it's like putting a cellophane on your perfume, you know. It's or or, or if you have a box and without galaxolite, the box is still the box. But if you put galaxolite in it, somehow you have the cellophane around and interesting, it, interesting it, analogy. It looks a bit more elegant or mm -hmm. yes professional something like this <laughs> yeah okay so so okay so you you got into being a perfumer you got trained up what were, what were the first jobs that you remember being given you know i mean was there a first sort of moment um, where you're like ah, i got this like whoops i lost my pen yeah it was not so fancy you know because the company i joined it was much more a copycat company they were all mainly working for middle east or some other me too brands so we were not creating a lot. Usually we were reconst we do were doing reconstructions or copies actually of existing perfumes or uh, and then in the, the best case was you, you took a perfume and the client asked you, oh, can we get the shampoo out of it? So then you you had a little bit of creation as well. So but of course I spent seven, eight years in that company, and of course the, the company developed as well. So more and more we had uh possibilities to create and i think i was one of my really good creations was a 72 ton a year perfume for a Cote d'Ivoire for the ivory coast um for a soap so it was a extremely cheap sheet bar so um was like five euro cost mm -hmm. at the dosage of 0 0.2 percent and still i won the business against uh yeah other big companies Mm, that's amazing so this was for me this was a hoo -hoo -hoo, yeah I, uh, and it was for the ivory coast so it was for the african market yes exactly is there a, i mean i gosh there's so many big soap bars and they washed everything with the yeah. soap and it was is there a, a difference between the markets a, i mean do you find that the for instance when you're when you're doing something for i mean i think i know the answer but curious about it for your work if you're doing something for say uh you know the european market versus the north american market versus like middle east um, is there a big difference in sort of how you, yeah. So talk about that a little bit, if you don't mind. Yeah, there are preferences, you know, coming from the market. But when, for example, for me, it's very interesting what's going on in the U.S. market or in the North American North market. America, yeah. Um, I see there is a, a shift towards a bit Oriental perfume concepts mm -hmm. and because when, when I started, or or let's say 15 years ago, it was. I, I, you, everyone could spot actually in the industry, oh, this is, must be an Amer North American product because it's so clean, it's clear, it's, uh, you know, it's, it was not so romantic at that mm. time. It was, maybe it's it, the wrong words, but... Uh, Are you talking about French things like, or, like white musk or something by Body Shop? Like, is that what you mean by clean and clear? Or? Yeah, or even, even if you look at the Rolf Lauren uh, product line, you know, even the, the fine fragrance, Ralph Lauren, they, they were different than stuff you found in, in the US, uh, sorry, in, in Europe, or a whole Perry Ellis line, or a, a Nautica, for example. For me, they were always a bit more clear, more, 
yeah, less romantic actually. While mm. um, European perfumery always had a little bit the drift into Oriental or a bit more, um, maybe yeah, over romantic. I, I don't know how, how to say, but more bold, maybe more mm. more patchouli, you know. So a bit things like that. And I think nowadays it's difficult to have this clear um, line in between. Mm. But of course, if you compare North America with Dubai, then it's a, it's a completely different story as well. <laughs> yeah. so because Dubai, they, they, they I mean, I worked favor. a lot in, in, uh, in the Middle East. Yeah, I know. You <laughs> I worked spent a lot, a lot in this market. In and there, of course, it's, it's a more, much more important that, that others perceive your perfume, which this is something people in Switzerland, they don't appreciate. I mean, in France, it's a bit so-so. But if you enter an elevator and you can only smell the, the other person in the elevator, I think it's perceived as impolite. Yeah, in the US, um, I think so too. Yeah, still. Yeah. Yeah, yes. that's definitely a different yeah, perception. Yeah. So imposing I think space. At least people really like to do it. So if, if you work on scent uh, concepts for a for Middle East, you always you load, you, load, you, you make radiant stuff, bold stuff. Hmm. Cool. Um, okay. So, so I mean, so you, you became a perfumer over all these years. So, so what was it about perfumery that really spoke to you in the end? I mean, what do you, what do you enjoy about the creative process of creating scent? And, and then I want to talk a little bit about your practice now. You know, I'm, I mean, I, I was pretty naive because when I look at formulas and compare formulas I'm doing now and I did like 15 years ago, um, I didn't understand at that time that sometimes taking out something makes a fragrance stronger or or adds something to a, to a fragrance. So uh, it was a it was very funny because I was loading, 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 and then of course I had something which was okay. But nowadays I I I start on much simpler base actually. I mm. mean, yeah. But so, of course, and, now I studied a little bit the market, so I know already which overdose may give you which which perfume direction everyone knows. And uh, at the beginning, I haven't had this, of course. So then I was thinking if I use uh, a little bit of Castoreum uh, and uh, Orange Flower Accord, I was thinking, wow, that's something great. But nowadays I would say, okay, it's nice try to do a Lamal, so mm, already done. So. so what do you mean? You mean you're sort of self-editing based on what's been done or? Yeah, you know, sometimes for me, perfume is also a bit frustrating because the more you know, the more you yeah. know the market, the more you realize there. And because every perfume for me or every scent works with an overdose, overdose of one, maybe two raw materials. And nowadays I realize if, if I do, let's say overdose, as I said, let's say orange blossom, a little bit of scatol uh, or animalic stuff um, with some dihydromyrcinol, it will lead me to a lemal. As I, as I burned into my memory, this combination as being lemal, I'm, I struggle actually to do, to recreate something by using the same overdoses because it always takes me back to all oh, this is normal mm. and it happens with a lot of combinations already i mean if you take the ibq with uh, maybe some lemon iso is super then you you go to a tuscany leather tom ford and everything you do with using this raw material com combination will lead you back or will remind you oh it's a you know tom something ford. That's and been it's done sometimes before. it's a bit yeah. Frustrating today because nowadays I, I catch myself, oh, isn't it smelling like this or isn't it smelling like that? While before I was much more free. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the danger of knowing a lot, right? You become really paralyzed by knowledge. I, I had a similar thing when I started the Institute. I was like, whatever, you know, and now I'm like, oh, crap, you know, knowledge becomes really paralyzing sometimes. And, and the quest for originality as a perfumer, that must be super challenging with all this, you know, I mean, so how do you try to, I mean, how do you navigate that? Uh, for instance, you have this brand now called Perfume Sucks. 
uh, which we'll talk about the titling soon. But I mean, how do you make sure, how do you ensure that the work you put out for Perfume Sucks is something that is, you know, original um, as far as you I mean, can? sometimes it's, it's completely not original because mm. these are my lost projects, you know? Mm -hmm. So if a client asks, requests me to recreate something new around an existing fragrance, let's say, uh, I mean, the, the red of perfume socks was, uh, was a twist around Dior, uh, Sauvage from Dior. Okay. So I would say 80% of the formula is still very, very similar, like the Dior Sauvage, Sauvage from Dior. But then I twisted it with something else. So, but there I, I clearly uh, communicate that it's not, not actually a creation. Mm. But what I prefer instead of naming a creator, I would, because for me as a perfumer, it's not the creator because then I, I, I just lost, you know, I'm, I'm completely fruit salad because mm -hmm. I'm born 20, 30 years too late. So whatever I do is actually has been there already. And yeah. if someone knows it, he can point me and say, ah, oh, Oh, you yeah. stole from there. Yeah, or, totally. But even if you lock yourself in, in a box and you create, at the end of the year, you will come out, if you create every day a fragrance, I mean, 350 will smell like something existing already. So, and nowadays I would say, let's speak about raw materials, raw material um, combinations, and not about the uh, creators, because even if I'm creating something, I think there is a force working through through my hands, with my hands, through my mind, bringing this uh, energy together in a bottle. So I think if, if it's not me, it's maybe someone else. And maybe at the same time in India, someone does exactly the same. Maybe he's not so loud or... You yeah, know. I mean, this cultural sort of quest for originality and for authorship, you know, and, and especially I think recently, because there's, there's this sort of, you know, every, the big truism is, I will no one need the perfumers. And now, I mean, there's this huge push for the perfumers and the perfumers are becoming sort of the rock stars within the industry. And I mean, the, it always strikes me as being super challenging for that reason, because I mean, yeah, I mean, things have been done, you know, um, and, and I always liked about you that you kind of, you're humble, you're, you're, you're honest about that. You know, you're not like, oh, look at me in my garret with my pipettes being a genius. You're just like, look, I just put these materials together. And then you print the formulas on your bottles, yeah. which I think is really interesting. So talk yes. about that a little bit. Yeah, when I founded the brand, I mean, you have to see, I was in my 30 years i built it up a company already in turkey so they chew me a bit up and uh, but it was fine because it was win-win at the end but i joined another company and they promised me oh you will become one of the fine fragrance perfumer and so on and at the end i was not um how to say commercial enough with my own personality so i never got breathings and whenever I got briefings, because in a company, you know, there is a, a project leader or an, a general FDM, he shares the work with the perfumers according to their skills. But if you can never prove your skills, you will never get your, um, your project. So I always got the projects the other way around. And if I won it, it was a big drama because they had to say, okay, this guy can do something. So at the end, I addressed each and every one. I went up the stairs, and but I I I I I bit on stone. So, so and this was actually um, one of the sources because that perfume sucks. So I mean, in the industry, if you want to be successful, usually you are son of someone, or you are married with someone, or you are somewhere in the family, or or you're very good with uh, vitamin B or self-marketing. So for me, the industry was actually pretty close. So I say, okay, really perfume sucks. No one wants to know what's really inside of the bottle. They only want to listen to stories. So they still, we still speak about rose nowadays. I mean, if you look at the legislation in, in Europe, uh, to be honest, if you put more than one part one per mil, one gram, a kilogram rose in your formula, and you, you make a dosage of 15%, your formula is not proven to be safe. Mm. 
<laughs> and there is still the, when you read Olfakti's description, ah, oh, there is a rose, there is lily of the valley, and, uh, and amber, and wild musk, I mean, come on, like, you know, and then, if, if people, when, when I meet people and they're not knowing that I'm perfumer, but I say, oh, you smell so good. Yeah, it's very expensive, you know, and uh, there is a real rose in it. And they say, okay, but uh, you may get cancer. <laughs> <laughs> if there is real rose in it. And uh, yeah, exactly. So no, but, you know, people, they don't really care about the smell. But they care about the bottle design, they care about the artist doing the, the advertisement, they care about the story. And sometimes it's really sad for me, as a perfumer it hurts, and this is really the base of perfume socks. So I wanted to give actually transparency to, uh, to a very old industry, always hiding uh, you know, behind the bottles and the roses. So this was the, actually the initial uh, approach I took uh, yeah I always um I mean obviously we're like-minded that's why we're friends you know but I always think it because it's one thing to say all this you know because a lot of people would agree with you but it's another thing to actually do it and I don't know if everybody on this call is familiar with uh, with with the brand perfume sucks but uh, first of all check it out but he what we're referring to is that Andreas has all the materials and, and proportions um printed on the back of the bottle and and so I, I remember when you first came out with it, I was like, well, what happens if people just make their own? And you said, yeah, you know, go for it. Good luck, you know? So, I mean, so talk a little bit about that sense of protection versus openness for you. I mean, what, what, what is the risk for being so open for you? Uh, for me, there's no risk actually, because I think you, you stay healthy, healthier if you're not always afraid that someone will copy what you did. And on the other hand, if you if you look in the industry, I mean, it takes two hours of analytical time, and then you have to you can come up with the formula anyway. So it's 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 just a, a lie saying if if you only sell the perfume, no one will find out what's inside, or will be able to to recreate the same. And and if you look in perfumery anyway, I mean, I can name a lot of fragrance. They have been highly inspired by something else you know, something else have been available before and maybe it's a new raw material launched by uh, Firmenich, uh, IFF, Shimoda, whoever which allows you to instead of using an old violet note you can use a new violet note and then the, the fragrance of course for, for public people it will smell different but for a perfumer it smells like oh, okay la 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 ah oh, violet okay You know, yeah. and even if 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 you if you go to a Art no Institute for Art No Faction and you have one of my bottles, please compound it yourself. Maybe you do it even better than me. <laughs> but I mean, okay, I mean, I, I you know, obviously we agree um, personally. But but then I, I'm I guess the 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 fear. I mean, okay, because we're doing this open sourcing small culture project, which you're very familiar with. I know you've shared some formulas. Thank you. Um, I guess the question that a lot of people are giving us with that, and I'm curious about your answer, is, is so if, if, we're, if everything's open and everything's public and, and everyone can do everything, then, then aren't we sort of shooting the, the perfume industry in the foot? Or, you know, um, what do you think about that? I mean... Yeah, but then think about in general about the industry, you know? Do, do everyone has to be, become bigger every time? Yeah, I agree. I mean, actually... I look at Nestle or all the multinationals, they always, they need to become bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and nowadays that with innovation, you can't win actually. You have to copy and push smaller ones out of the business. I think if, if you would live in a world, I mean, I also like the idea of supply, uh, support your local dealer. I mean, why do I need the product uh, made in, uh, in India, if I could get the same in Switzerland, but of course more expensive, but I earn more more money uh, and so on. I think this is something we, we have to change, but time will show. I think this, things like this, they, they have to disappear. This I think I strongly believe in evolution. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, I agree. <laughs> and so I guess I guess the sort of move towards transparency is a first step in in sort of changing that that hegemony that corporate control over everything. Is that how you see it? 
Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and you, there are a lot of other examples as well where you find uh, maybe maybe more on uh, internet driven applications where you see the open codes and everything. And mm, yeah. I think as a society, this this will bring us bring us further. Yeah, and like the open science movement, for instance, yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, okay, that's thank you, Andreas. I love I I, lo I always love talking to you. I should call this conversation with friends because it's always <laughs> nice. I always learn so much. So so let's move aside from perfume just for a second, or from traditional sort of mm -hmm. spray perfume. You do a lot of work um, creatively with scent. You do a lot of art projects with scent. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you started doing that and why and sort of? Yes, actually, when I uh, in two thousand and seven. Um, I, I had a bit enough from the industry. So I, I wanted to create my own company or my, to, to bring to work with my own vision of scent. And it turned out that my first client was a gallery and they had an exhibition from uh, Rotko, all these red paintings. And there was an old lady and she said she would like to irritate the people. So what can we do? And they say, oh, why not launching a, a green scent, making the whole building smelling green? Do you want it to irritate oh, them? Yeah, because when you have red paintings, but the smell is green, your perception of the picture changed. <laughs> and we, we took a very easy um, molecule. It was C3, C3 hexanol with, of course, a little bit underlined. So it, it remains a bit stable in the technique we use to diffuse it in the room. Um, but people, they, they, they really told, they, they told us that this painting, it, I'm not sure if it's red or not because it smells green and I'm not sure if it looks blue. And this was actually the early beginning of starting to do or getting interested in um, interaction in the room or uh, yeah, with people on, on, on this, on, on, on such a level. And then, uh, I don't know, one step to got the other. So. A, and nowadays I have uh, maybe every year I have 10 to 20 projects interesting, sometimes much more artistic, sometimes just a little bit less artistic, but maybe more, more commercial as well. But uh, yeah, for me, it's really refreshing because I'm not, I don't work. I don't have any, um, okay. I have less contacts any, anymore with the, with the regular industry. But I'm I'm less fighting um, the normal problems I would face when I launch a perfume, because in art still everything is possible. While in perfume, if you have to to make money out of it, then not everything is possible anymore. Yeah, but it, but everything's possible in art. I, I agree. At the same time, I mean, I think the olfactory art world is facing similar problems that people are sort of doomed to repeat each other a little bit. You know, I mean. I only know from my vantage point, I'm seeing projects pitched that, you know, have been pitched 30 times before, you know, so, I mean, there is that challenge, I think, with, with olfactory art, I guess, if we want to call it that, as, as with perfume, that, yeah, without... Yeah, but if people would know the smell of Geosmin, you know, Geosmin wouldn't be part of art projects. And nowadays, for me, art or... or Art with, with, with scent is still in the baby shoes. So, you no. Know, when I look at it, it's mostly it needs to be um, provocative. Um, it needs to to make the people crazy to let them think about. But these are extremes, and I'm actually looking forward. Um, and I can name a very nice project we had, for example, uh, uh, Ocean of Air with the, the Phillies and uh, yeah. Marshmallow Laser Feast show in the Saatchi Gallery, now going on tour to Toronto and so on. So if you guys aren't um, familiar, quickly, um, the Feelies is a, is a group started by Grace Boyle in London, uh, and she, she does a lot of sort of, um, I guess, immersive experiences using scent. And Marshmallow Laser Feast, they do motion design, is that correct? Yes. An installation. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Carry on. Yes, exactly. So at the end, it was a virtual reality experience, and you had a, you had a, a Google on it. You had earphones. You had a whole connection, everything. You had a connectors here, so you could they, they could Feel. you could see your blood flow. It was uh, measuring your oxygen level in your body. Um, you could see your uh, exhale, your when you when you you breathe. And um, it was an, an, an installation about uh, uh, giant uh, 
ah, mammoth trees, mm -hmm. the sequoia trees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are not many left anymore, and they made a three um, D rendering of this tree. And it was funny because while you were um, breathing out, you could see oh, there is a lot of CO two. It it showed you blue. Uh, you could see, um, and this blue CO2 went into the tree and the, the tree was transforming it back to, uh, um, to oxygen, which was delivered to you again in form of red clouds, bubbles. You could inhale them again and you, you could see in your veins, oh, my blood, I have more oxygen in it. And this was, everything was linked together with the very nice fragrance of the um, surrounding, you know, very naturalistic, but of course it was geosamine, but maybe at a low level but you could see if you would have known it you would have uh, um, perceived it or it, you yeah. could have named it and uh, yeah. but but for me it was the, the best thing was that 80 percent of the people they didn't say there was a perfume in the room they say no it oh, the, so they, they asked them oh, how did you feel oh, i feel amazing la, la, la. what did you see they could explain what you see and then at the end what did you smell oh it was a, a forest so, but you think where did they did the fragrance came from? And oh, oh, they, <laughs> yeah, Grace came and so. demonstrated it. I was teaching at the Royal College of Art, I guess, earlier this year, and Grace Grace came and demonstrated it, and it was it was phenomenal. Like the and I, you know, I'm I know, you know, I know what to expect, and I was still, it still mm -hmm. it works somehow, doesn't it? You know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, are there any yeah. other um, projects you did in in the sort of realm of olfactory art that you find m most recently that you find interesting? Yeah, I mean, maybe still my chewing gum project. Oh, yeah. Tell people about it. that because it's pretty cool. So I was a bit, you know, I have kids. So and whenever I there is an art project uh, using scent in Switzerland, they have to join me and we go there. And always after five minutes, they get headache. So they're always, nye, de, de, nye, art, nye, nye, not again. <laughs> and uh, because also there, I mean, the, the, the scent given in, into the air is usually at the very higher level so each and everyone can smell it and i'm not a big fan of this I, I prefer people go out and they say oh was there a scent and then they may go back and then they realize oh there is really a scent and then they can start to, to understand but like this it's not bothering or it's not uh yeah bothering the people so i had a request if i want to do an artwork on my own and it was in an old castle in switzerland and there were a lot of perfumers. Christophe Lodamiel was there. Uh, actually, the only name I remember. There were some other. Uh, yeah, anyway, never mind. Um, they came from everywhere. So they asked me if I want to join and if I could join and do the kitchen. So because kitchen is a place, are they? You know, we imagined there were scents before and, and so on. So, but for, for me, it was a bit boring. So I said, okay, I will play in the kitchen, no worries. But I wanted to find another way how to a bit more intimate. So I made chewing gums, um, art chewing gums. Uh, one of them was smelling like, uh, like an old lady. She was the lady doing the chronicles of, uh, of this castle. And the longer you chew her, the more close you came to her. So it was interesting because first it was a bit of um, maybe lilac. Uh, and then the more you chew it, you could get to, um, let's say violet leaf nodes mm -hmm. and violet leaf node is trans to non-enal, non -enal, sorry. Um, actually old people, when they're, they're at a certain stage when their body is not uh, recovering or I don't know, the, mm -hmm. the cell is yeah. regeneration is not so much anymore. And then they start to smell like this, uh, giving a bit a trace of uh, these non -adienals. So I used it so, and the longer you chew, the more close you came to her. Wow. And for me, it was interesting to see actually that you could, while I was chewing a chewing gum, I was enjoying an art project, but no one around could, could feel it. And uh, this, for me, it was a very it's nice. nice. It's uh, hyper personal experience of it. Yeah, exactly. And, and exactly. so, so um, in terms of projects uh, that are outside of sort of perfume, perfume, uh, I know that you're very involved in a, a fairly new initiative called algorithmic perfumery. Mm -hmm. uh, that is based in, in the Netherlands and also in the U.S. 
Um, can you tell me a little bit? Of, first of all, can you explain a little bit of what that is? I, I'm being disingenuous. I totally know what it is, but I'd love to hear it in your words. Um, and sort of what you're, what you're, well, start with that. Maybe. Okay, the idea is actually that uh, we create a machine, um, let's say compounding machine, so it means, but this is just one part actually, but yeah, I, I, I'm fascinated with that already. Yeah. So um, the idea is that each and every one by um, getting help from uh, algorithm or uh, artificial, artificial intelligence by um, filling out a form, let's say that it's, it's a little bit about scent, but it's also about shape, it's about the personal style, about perception and everything. So you, it's amazingly done. But the idea is that each and every one can create his own perfume using the questionnaire and uh, the software, the helping software. And it's, yeah, for me, it, it, it works actually. Um, we are a group of perfume, a bunch of perfumers. Um, creating with the software, teaching the AI, the algorithm, because of course at, at the beginning it's uh, it's just, an, I don't know much about algorithm actually, but uh, I got it explained like this, that an empty algorithm does, doesn't do anything. So you have to feed him, you have also to feedback the algorithm at the moment the algorithm came up with the new formula. Of course you have to smell it, you have to evaluate it, you have to feedback it, and then the AI will re redo the formula. And, uh, and learn basically exactly yeah. learn how to create perfume and for yeah. me it's a uh, amazing uh, really amazing project yeah so to give everyone a little context if you're not familiar it's a project that was initiated um, uh, with IFF and implemented uh, by a, a technologist slash artist called Frederick Durink with a whole team of people back in 2000 and Lord 2018 I think or 17 maybe even 18 mm -hmm. Uh, and it premiered in IFF in New York as an art project along with a bunch of other projects. And then, um, yeah, uh, some folks, the people behind it basically decided to turn it into a larger a larger initiative. So this, the people who run it now are uh, Frederick Durink and Anahita Mechanique um, with a whole team of people, of course, technologists and whatnot. And then there's a perfume team headed headed by Anahita who has a background in uh, in, uh, what's the word um, when you're assessing? No, not assessing. What's, what's the FDM, pregnancy huh? development manager. Thank or... you. <laughs> I always forget the terminology. But so Andreas is part of a team of perfumers who were brought on to sort of make the sense and assess the sense and make sure that they worked for safety and health. And there's a lot of challenges in that, of course. Evaluator. Thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, so, 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 um, Andreas has been working with with a couple other people, like Strostrosopoulos, and of course Fred, and of course Anahita, to to sort of develop this whole system. And there's been some challenges along the way, I believe, in terms of just how do you get sense to work in sort of every permutation. Yeah, I mean, you know, as as always, when you want to create a, perf a a product or a perfume which will enter the market, and there actually we have a uh, hundred million of combinations, which could immediately being mixed and launched and um, how to say, released into yeah. the market. So uh, one of the biggest topic was uh, tech tox toxicology, toxicology. I mean, to do all the legislation and imagine, I mean, we are building up the machine in Europe, um, exhibiting in, in, uh, in the US, for example. So then you have already two legislation you have to take care of. Uh, then of course, combinations, I mean, for me, one this was really one of the challenges to to make the toxin right. I mean, at the end, it it was only calculation or cleaning up the accords because um, partly these machines is using accords, but also um, natural essential oils or aroma, single aroma chemicals. So then you always have interactions with them from a tox point of view. Um, how to say even essential oils are multi-component mixtures so there you, you really need uh, to, to be keen that you're not doing something uh, which is harmful to people and then of course i mean also you you can't do 100 million combination to show the ai how perfumery creation works so we had to set up um let's say relation of 
of raw materials, for example, saying uh, A doesn't go well with B, but uh, but then on the other hand, I mean, there is not only one perfumer, so there every perfumer has his own signature, a little bit, his own view, uh, point out a few. Yeah, yeah. So of course, there were also a lot of things to be discussed because human compromises. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I would a... say so far we did amazing well and. Uh, if I may say, there were people mm, laughing about or thinking, okay, this is impossible, an impossible project. But mm. nowadays, I think we, we gain their yeah, respect. That's good news. So, so just so everyone knows, this is soon going to launch an online uh, sort of app where you can actually experience it yourself and, and get samples based on, on the AI. Um, so, you know, watch that space. And um, Andreas, of course, has been extremely involved. Um, does this mushroom creation overcome the have smelled that before? But, oh yeah, okay, so Vera, uh, hi Vera, asks that if the method of creation, I assume she means within the AI overcomes that sort of bias, smelled that before problem for you. This was a, a, also something something we had we had to define, you know, um, that certain combination they, but but this is, it's it's a funny point because Sometimes the, the human brain is limited, you know. Um, if, if I may tell you, I have a pinball machine in my lab. And, and this is one of the most important um, creation tools I have. So because whenever I stuck in a creation process, I go and play around pinball. And pinball, I have five balls. I want to win. I don't want to lose. I don't want to blame myself. So I want to win. If I want to win, I have to be there 100%. So if in this 10 minutes, five minutes, there's no space for something else. And like this, I can cheat a little bit my brain to step out of a topic where I was running in circles. And I would say the AI has enough capacity to start maybe with a combination, which is known as something X, Y, Z from the market. But how to say? Um, but twisting something else in it, which actually we say it doesn't work, the human perfumers, because out of our experience, it doesn't work, but AI is trying this combination. And like this, we, we even create fragrances where human or perfumers, experienced perfumers say, no, it won't work. At the end, it will work. And it takes to something else. I don't know if I could have... Uh, explained a little bit but for me this is a is a an extra value of of having a ai driven or driven developments in in this direction mm -hmm. because ai thinks much more out of the box than human the humans can do. Ever do yeah 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 uh, i i know there's a lot of sort of fear but um but it sounds like uh it sounds like you see it as a very useful tool you know um as yes, do I, and funny wise, even other companies. I mean, I think from Simrise to Shivodan to yeah. all the big ones, they work already with AI. For sure. Of course, at, at different stages. I think in Shivodan, um, AI is doing um, proposition, mm -hmm. uh, even uh, for FDMs, for evaluators, saying, mm -hmm. look, in this market, there is a between jasmine and uh, orange blossom, we have a blind spot. Maybe if we can launch there something, not losing the connection of the of the market, la la la, then you could still create something new, which has a good uh, liking from the market. Means it, uh, it it will be hot cake. People will like it and buy. Yeah, it's the future. Um, okay, well, I, I can't believe it, but we're just about out of time. So let's just take a few moments for questions from, from, mm -hmm. from the community. Um, sorry, I got lost in, in the conversation. I didn't keep an eye on the clock. Are there any quick questions you want me to ask Andreas before we um, say adios? Someone's going to pop in. Uh, yeah, and, and Donna, uh, algorithmicperfumery.com is where to keep an eye on the progress. Uh, Chach is asking you, Andreas, uh, what are you were looking forward to this year? It was a funny year, actually, because I lost some big projects. But <laughs> before I could cry, other big projects 
jumped in. So actually, I'm I'm looking forward to get a bit better on my own feet because you you have to understand I was always working for other um, clients for other companies. Yeah, maybe part time as a freelancer, whatever. But nowadays, I'm only on my own. I'm working for my own company. For of course, I'm giving contribution to uh, AI and, and, and as well, algorithmic perfumery. But basically, I'm on my own. And I'm looking much forward to what happened, where, where it leads me, because um, I, I realized I was never brave enough to jump out of the industry and really stand on my own feet. So now it just happened. And uh, yeah. And the next question, yeah, because yeah, how was your experience, how with was your experience working with uh, Velida? Um, the pro, the, the, how to say it was an amazing uh, experience. I learned a lot about essential oils, or I, actually, it was kind of back to the basic. Um, they were quite open because I, I was the first perfumer working with them before they worked with the aromatherapists. So I could, uh, my formulas they were completely different to what I had seen before. Um, no, 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 no. And yeah, it, we had some some funny things because on one hand they wanted to have an oriental fragrances, but they didn't allow me to work with uh, patchouli because Rudolf Steiner didn't like patchouli. <laughs> but if you look at patchouli, the <laughs> aromatherapy profile brings you closer to together to yourself. So it was it was funny, but also had some sometimes it had a bit uh, a bitter taste as well. Um. But, well, maybe this sort of ties into uh, Susan's uh, question, which is, what's your experience dealing with clients? Um, do you communicate directly on your own, or do you have someone in the middle helping, typically? Unfortunately, I don't have someone in between. I would wish sometimes. <laughs> Wouldn't it be helpful? I prefer just to, to talk open, you know. I, I mean, I, I even I show them the formula. Sometimes they want to have a copy of the formula, then I give them the formula. Why not? So... And that's pretty abnormal within within the field. Like when there's independent perfumers working for clients, typically the formulas aren't shared, right? Yeah, but so imagine that, what what should they do with the formula? Should they go to a manufacturer? Then they get a five times, ten times more the price. It it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, so, yeah. You come from a place of confidence there. If they want to cheat you, then they cheat you anyway. Yeah, that's true. Um, and then I think it's going to have to be the last question from Cynthia, which is which cultures um, do you find are more open to experimentation with fragrance? If you can generalize broadly, I'm sure there's exceptions to every, I'm of course going to say North America. It's, it's, it's <laughs> difficult to say. I mean, I, I would say if you meet someone on a personal level, everyone is, is open actually to ex, 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 um, experiment with, with fragrance, but you can say in Switzerland, I mean, if you go out on the street, it doesn't smell a lot, um, which is a different case when you go, for example, Middle East or India or something. There, it's the, the aroma in the air is just uh, breathe, breathe taking already. So, but I'm, I'm not sure if this means that these cultures are more open, they are just somehow more used or less bothered. While in Switzerland, people, if, if you wear a perfume, which they don't know, they may, oh, I get a headache because I don't know what it is. Maybe there is a gas leak around or something. Um, <laughs> yeah. But what I can say, there is an old perfumery joke. And they say, if you, if a perfumer likes something, he just shut, he should, well, he should just shut up and take it home. Because if I like something means I'm, it's professional distortion means it won't smell like something available on the market. So the, the, the best case is I take it home and I shut up or I show it to my evaluator and this guy says or girl says, okay, oh, it's nice. Let's present it to the, to the sales guy. And the worst case, sales guy says, oh, yeah, nice. Let's present it to the client. And the client says, oh, yeah, nice. Let's, let's risk it. Then he orders 10 tons. He produces a shitload of perfume and no one buys them because the market is not ready for it. Hmm. So that's... So take it home and enjoy it privately. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, I like to end on a joke. So, Andreas, thank you so much. I always love talking to you. Um, thank you too. I like your I like your slightly anarchistic but very humorous mindset. Um, yeah. And everybody, thank you for joining. Uh, it's thank really. You as well.
Yeah, I've been enjoying this series. The next person we're going to have on this series is a person called Kaya Sarindo, who is a creative director and, well, perfume brand owner from New York. His brand is called Folie à Plusieurs, and he's worked with people like, I mean, you name it, he's worked with them. They're pretty, he's a pretty fascinating guy, so definitely join us for that at the end of May. And we will put this video online with Andreas's permission granted. Permission granted? Andreas? Yes, yes, permission yes? Okay. granted. It's on for camera. Sure, for sure, for sure. Sorry. <laughs> so be able to check it out <laughs> on the internet. So, all right, everybody, thank you so much. And feel free to unmute yourself and say goodbye if you want. Bye, thank you. Bye, bye. 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 Talk to you later. Thank you so much.